everyone, and welcome to Financing 101. We'll be covering 10 different ways to get funding for your company. This is the third part in our series covering the landscape of plant proteins in Alberta. We started with Plant Protein 101, then we had Fractionation 101, and now Financing 101. If you would like to catch up, you can view our previous videos on YouTube, um, and you can find the links on ppaa.ca. Each week we post our latest recordings of the webinar so that you can catch up if you've missed anything. Today we'll have a quick introduction, presentation, there will be time for question and answer, a few closing notes, and then there will be time in the breakout room so that you can have some further discussion and networking with the presenters. It's also a great opportunity for you to meet the other people that come to these webinars. Uh, we see a great representation across the plant protein ecosystem from business people, industry partners, and educational partners, and, and people who are just generally interested in what is going on with plant protein. I see we have about 46 people in the room, which is a great turnout. Thank you everyone for coming. As well, we have members of our team here. So there's Barb Wilkinson, the communications director, Chris Glass, marketing specialist, and myself, Shannon Snaden. We also have Dan Bruin, the CEO of Plant Protein Alliance, is here, and Donna, who will be helping with moderation today. You'll also see Corey Keith, our first speaker, and he's from Keith & Associates, as well as Ahmed, who is the president of Nabadi Foods. Thank you very much for coming to speak to us today. I'd like to give you a quick introduction on the Plant Protein Alliance. We work to connect people across the ecosystem, and we're helping Canada to become a leader in plant-based processing. We work to facilitate the development of a diverse, profitable, and sustainable plant protein and plant ingredient processing industry. And for us, that looks like having highly functioning value chains, state-of-the-art infrastructure, commercialized market-driven products, and becoming really a key economic driver in the Alberta economy. We grow a lot of the plant protein crops here in Alberta. However, we're exporting them as a raw good, where there's a really great opportunity that we could do some of that value-added processing here. The different events that we host are about bringing that ecosystem together and making it so that uh, all the disparate groups are connected so that we can really um, have some more of that value-added processing here. We are a relatively new nonprofit. Last year, we had 13 different events and workshops, and we had over 2,500 attendees. We offer different opportunities for members to have networking, workshops, and excellent guest speakers. In our 2020 PPAA member survey, we received uh, great feedback. One of our participants said that they've connected with several people as a result of a PPAA conference, and that helped them to move their business forward. With the pandemic, things have had to change a little bit in how we operate. And so now we offer monthly webinars and they've been well attended so far. And you're welcome to view our past recordings on our website, ppaa.ca. As well, another way that you can connect with us is to sign up for our new monthly newsletters. We have two different newsletters that go out each month. We highlight industry stories, member highlights, and industry events. So if you want to know when our next webinar is, I highly recommend signing up for the newsletter. As a nonprofit, we do depend on our memberships, and we would like to let you know about a special promotion. If you sign up for a paid membership, we will extend your, your membership length by three months. However, there's an additional option now that is new as of this webinar that I'd like you to know about. In recognition of the challenging times that we're experiencing, we'd like to offer complimentary memberships for those that are unable to pay at this time. We would like to have you become part of the work that we're doing moving forward, and we don't want to have cost be, a, be something that prevents anyone from, from being a member. So. If you would like to sign up for a complimentary membership, you can do that on ppaa.ca as well. And now onto our feature presentation, and I'll invite uh, Corey to now share his screen. 
All right. Well, thanks, Shannon. Thanks to you and everybody on the team for organizing these events. They're just fantastic. And uh, you guys do a great job. So thank you. Thanks also to everybody for joining in. Um, you know, as Shannon said, these are interesting times, but it's great to see everyone uh, participating and taking an interest in how to grow our economy. Um, I also want to thank Alberta Agriculture. They've been really supportive of PPAA since day one, which is fantastic. And I'll just give a shout out as well to a couple of sponsors. Uh, Myers Norris Penny have been supportive of us since the very first day we started, even before we formally incorporated. Uh, and Crystal Cardinal it, uh, has been really helpful. And uh, I'll also give a shout out to uh, Farm Credit Corp and my friend Harvey Belanger there because they've also been really supportive. And if any of you are so inclined, we really need the support of industry. We need sponsors, we need memberships. It's important for uh, not-for-profit organizations like us to have that support. So if you think this is worthwhile, please uh, show your support that way. I feel like I'm doing a, uh, a, a fundraiser for uh, a TV channel that uh, is not for profit. Anyway, this is the third and final presentation of the Fractionation 101 series and uh, David and Trevor did outstanding jobs uh, on their presentations and I can only hope to do half as well as they did. So I hope you enjoy it and, and uh, that some of this information is useful. I would like to mention that, uh, as this says, it's time we face reality, my friends. We're not exactly rocket scientists. And most of this really is not rocket science. It's a lot of common sense, but it's really important to be aware of these factors. Uh, I'd like to start just by explaining a couple of things about how lenders view things differently than an investor. And it's important to understand the difference because your approach will be different based on who you're speaking with. So from a lender's perspective, there just isn't any upside. And by that, I mean, they don't share in uh, the, the big wealth creation if you happen to sell your company for 10 times what you've invested in it. Or, um, you know, if you go on a stock listing and every all the shareholders make a lot of money. Uh, they don't share in that. So they have no upside if your business is wildly successful, but they have significant downside if your business is not successful. Banking is a high volume, low margin business, and they operate that way and they get criticized sometimes for not doing higher risk deals. But in fact, that's not the business they're in. So just be aware that that lenders see things from a bit of a conservative perspective and that's of necessity because they don't have the upside to cover off large losses. They make a little bit of interest and uh, if they're lucky, they get their principal paid back. But if a company is wildly successful, they don't share in that huge upside. An, an investor, however, does have that upside so they can take on greater risk and they can uh, cover off some of the losses that the greater risk results or, or causes because they have that upside. So if they invest uh, in your company for, they put 100,000 in and the company sells for 10 million and maybe they get 2 million of that, they have a significant profit and that helps offset a lot of the losses that even the best investors have, they all have losses. Uh, so they still have downside, but they have much more upside. They have little control typically, unless they're a majority shareholder, which would be unusual. So they really have, uh, you know, they'll want a board seat often, but it's, it's a little less control than, uh, say, the founding shareholders. There's usually not any quick or obvious exit. Uh, they're usually in for a few years. There's no liquidity, by that I mean, uh, if you buy shares on the stock market and you decide you would like to uh, sell them, you can sell them at some price, whatever the market is at for those shares, but typically you can sell them. With a private company and an investor coming in, there really isn't a way for them to have easy liquidity very quickly. Um, my may like to play comment is that some investors, particularly angel investors, are often wealthy individuals who've done really well in business, have a fair bit of money tucked away, and they want to give back. 
And sometimes they just want to play. They want to get back in and uh, have that entrepreneurial spirit because if they've been very successful in business, what can tend to happen is their business gets bigger and bigger and bigger and they're not really smaller entrepreneurial companies anymore. And so sometimes they like to come back and play with an early stage company with, a, with an early stage entrepreneur. That doesn't necessarily mean, in fact, it probably doesn't mean that they want to get involved in everything day to day. They've been there, done that, but they want to get involved in and they can provide such great um, experience, expertise, networks that uh, they can be invaluable. And the comment about better than interest is I always say that you have to think about um, if you have money to invest, and I do another much longer seminar where I I ask questions and, and sort of have the audience do uh, an exercise. But if you have money to invest and your options are to put it in a high risk company with no exit, no liquidity, uh, and you may make a fair bit of money or you may lose it all, or you can put it in a bank in a GIC and earn interest, admittedly today, not a lot, but still, it's absolutely guaranteed. You can access your money any day you want. You can take part of it out or you can take it all out. Uh, that's always competition for someone investing in your company. So just something to keep in mind. So now the top 10 ways to get money from a bank of, or investor, and that's supposed to be a drum roll there. So number 10 is have a three C's vision, clear, concise, and compelling. If you don't know where you want to go, it's difficult to get there. And if you can't inspire people to join you on the trip to accomplishing your vision, it's much harder to sell them. The best leaders, uh, and there's studies that show the companies that have really good visions, their staff are more engaged, they're more productive. But when you're talking to investors in particular, but even bankers, if you know where you're going, you can spell it out properly. It's much, much more compelling uh, in order to try and attract funding. Now, I'm going to ask a question about, does anyone know where Springside, Saskatchewan is? And I'm really hoping nobody does because it kind of wrecks, wrecks the, the bit I'm going to do. So assume if you do that you don't know where Springside, Saskatchewan is. Assume that there is an investor there that wants to give you a million dollars, but they want you to come to Springside where they live to sign up the deal. They need you there by noon tomorrow for this probably one of the most important meetings of your life. So noon tomorrow in Springside, Saskatchewan, you have no idea where it is. What do you do? What's the first thing that you're likely to do? I would suggest that most of us would Google it. They'd pull up Google Maps, and then you would try and find out where Springside is. So first of all, you'd want to know where it is. And secondly, you'd want to see how to get there, you would probably plot out, well, I'll go uh, here and then I'll drive here and, and end up in Springside. How many of you would hop in your car tomorrow morning or this afternoon, start driving east towards Saskatchewan and hope that somehow by a miracle you might randomly end up in Springside, Saskatchewan for that most important meeting of your life? Would any of you do that? I don't think so. But that's exactly what you're doing if you don't have a vision. You're driving east into Saskatchewan and just hoping you will get somewhere. So I really encourage you to think about a proper vision and it takes a lot of time. I do a fair bit of work with companies, helping them develop visions and it's not an easy thing, but it is one of the best investments of time you can make. You have to know where you're going as this, uh, little picture illustrates. By the way, Springside, Saskatchewan is right near Yorkton, Saskatchewan. It's a lovely little town right adjacent to uh, Great uh, Good Spirit Lake, which is a beautiful little uh, lake. So that's where Springside is. If you learn nothing else from this, now you know where Springside is. Number nine, know who to approach. I always say don't go to Burger King to buy a car. And the reason I say that is People are always told, well, go see a venture capitalist, go see a venture capitalist. Well, the fact is that the vast majority of companies will never get venture capital. Venture capital wants very specific things. 
They want global markets. They want usually to invest large amounts, $2 million or more. And so you need to, and, and some of them are very specific about what industry they will invest in or where, where a company is in its growth, where it is in its life cycle. So you have to do some research and think about who you're going to approach. And if you don't have rev, um, pro, if you're not profitable, if you don't have security, if you're still just kind of in the idea stage and you go to a bank and want them to give you money, you're probably not going to have a very good experience. As I explained earlier, that's just not what banks do. Banks blend against uh, cash flow and, and they like security as an additional backup. Number eight, place the order. Clearly describe what you are looking for. They need to know what you want, how much. I have looked at more than a few business plans where they go into selling the company and they never tell you what they, that they actually want. And I've actually had to go down to the projections in the business plan. And then I see either investment going in or a new loan and you go, oh, that's what they're looking for. So right up front in the executive summary is where I recommend you put it. Place the order so people know what you're asking about. That gives context to everything else. It's very different to be looking at a deal if they're asking for 50,000 or if they're asking for 500 or 5 million or 50 million, it provides context. So no matter what, when you're talking to people, I always say on the surface, be cool as a cucumber on the inside, you can be like a squirrel in traffic, but seriously, don't, don't let them see you sweat. Number seven, show shareholder commitment. This is a, a pretty basic thing. If, you're the, uh, if you've got no money invested in your company and you want everybody else to invest, you want the bank to loan you money, you want other investors to put in the money, then you have to look at who's taking the most risk. And this is really all about risk. Bank risk uh, uh, is debt and investor risk is equity, but people are putting their money at risk and there has to be some sort of a quality in that situation. Know your numbers. I don't know if any of you watch uh, Shark Tank or Dragon's Den. The one thing people just get killed on all the time is that they don't know their numbers and they get caught up in that and they look foolish. There's a reason they ask those questions. That's how you know how your company is doing. And it's a test of whether you understand your company. I didn't have any accurate numbers, so I just made this one up. Studies have shown that accurate numbers aren't any better than the ones you make up. How many studies showed that? 87. I just think that's kind of a cute uh, illustration. Whoops. Number five, have your elevator pitch ready. Rehearse it, fine tune it. You never know when you might need it. What an elevator pitch is, is just like a 30 second quick hit on your company. This is who we are. This is uh, the problem that's out there. This is the problem we solve. And it's really just to grab people's attention instantly and get them engaged. And, and it's really important to have that because you never know when you might need it. And the goal is not to sell right there. People aren't gonna talk to you for 30 seconds or a minute and pull out their checkbook. The goal is for them to go, Oh, that's interesting. I want to learn more. And then you move on to there, you set up a meeting and so on. But have your elevator pitch ready because sometimes out of the blue, you might run into someone and it's such a golden opportunity. You don't want to waste it. This is something I really believe in. I'm a KISS kind of person. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Keep it simple. Don't go into a lot of uh, big words and so on. You're, you're not there to impress people with your linguistic capability. You're there to intrigue them about your company and help them understand. And if you can't get people to understand your business, they're not likely to invest in it. And it's your job to explain it to them. It's not their job to learn about it. You have to help them with that. Number four, be realistic. Provide a worst case scenario. If this happens, we'll, we'll still be able to survive. We'll take this action, kind of a SWOT analysis, but be realistic. Don't just show best case scenarios all the time. Identify risks and address them. 
show how you can still survive and be successful. One of the best ways that you can show your management team is capable. I've learned two important lessons in life. I can't recall the first one, but the second one is that I need to start writing stuff down. I find it's really, really helpful to write down things when you're going to be talking or doing a presentation. It helps align your thoughts. It helps uh, prepare you, even if you don't refer to the notes. I find it's helpful to write things down. Number three, have a detailed understanding of your market. There's always competition, always. I've had many people tell me over the years that this is a new product, it's so cool, it's got such great things that it'll do that there just is no competition. There is always competition. And sometimes your biggest competition is simply inertia. It is far easier to keep doing what you're doing than it is to try something new and assume risk. So always you need to understand your market, who your competitors are, what they sell for, and how you are going to attack that market and do better than they're doing already. And when you're selling to someone, especially in a larger corporate environment, those people have two kinds of risk. They have the business risk of taking on your product and what it might do to the business, but they also have personal risk of taking on your product it not working and they look like they don't know what they're doing or they're incompetent. So according to my market research, 90% of your customers, <coughs> excuse me, whoops, fantasize about beating you to death. What about the other 10%? They asked for your company address, but didn't say why. You don't wanna have that kind of marketing. Number two, recognize that a technology or product is only one piece of the puzzle. And that is because it's, it's got to be, you can, a technology isn't a company and a product isn't a company. And you have to have all of the right things around it. And if you can't show that you have proper management, that you don't have good marketing, that you can't produce the product at a reasonable price, that you don't understand who your competitors are, all of that, it'll be a hard sell. And sometimes, especially with earlier stage companies, when the person that developed the technology or the product is the one trying to run the company, they are uncomfortable with those things. And I'm not saying you should go hire all of those people to do those things. I'm saying you have to have access to that capability. It could just be an advisor. It could be an accountant you bring in just when you need them, but don't try and do it all yourself. And I've had a few meetings where you're talking to the president who developed the technology and he talks about this fantastic pen that he's developed. It writes upside down. It's super light. The ink doesn't smear. All of the different attributes of this new amazing pen, it'll write in space. And you say, well, that's really great. It's an interesting product. What about the finances? And they go, yeah, yeah, we've got that looked after. Did I tell you that my new pen will do this? And you go, yeah, but how are you going to produce it? well, we'll get somebody to build it for us. Did I tell you, and they go right back to the technology all the time because that's what they're comfortable with. And that's understandable, that's fair, but it won't get you money if you don't know how to build the proper uh, structure around to get it done. So a Kia job interview, it's, it is an interview when you're trying to get money from people. Prepare for it as though it was an interview plan. Think of what you might be asked and be ready to answer all the questions and to have addressed the things on this list. And the number one way to get money from a bank or an investor, I'm hoping after this, it won't be a big shock, have an outstanding management team. Management drives everything. If you don't have good management, it doesn't matter how good your technology is or how good your product is, because it's management that makes it happen. And I have seen rarely seen projections, especially even three-year, but maybe five-year projections that show what the company will do, where they, you know, three years, you look back and, yep, that's exactly what happened. Just not how it works in the real world, in the business world. And there are going to be things that will come at you that are unexpected. It's management that will overcome those obstacles, correct course, 
and drive the company forward to success. It looks a little like this. That's your plan at the top. You think it's going to be all smooth sailing, but reality is like the bottom. There's a lot of challenges that come along when you're trying to run a business, especially when you're an earlier stage company with a new product or a new technology. So it's management that gets you over all of those challenges, gets you through all of those valleys and makes you successful. So that's my presentation. What did you think? I didn't understand a word of it. You could have mentioned that an hour ago. Well, I didn't want to be rude. So I really hope that you don't feel that way about my presentation. Um, and I hope you found it at least a little bit useful. And so in the interest of time, I'm going to, I know we covered a lot of ground very quickly, but um, you know, we'll have time for Q&A after. So I'm now going to introduce our guest speaker and I'd like to thank Ahmed for um, uh, agreeing to take some time to speak to us. I have to tell you, I've had the pleasure of working with Ahmed for the last several months. He is absolutely one of the hardest working entrepreneurs I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. He's just incredibly knowledgeable. He's really dedicated to his business and I'm looking forward to his presentation. So please, I'll ask everyone to welcome the founder and president of Mabadi Foods, Amon Yeya. Hi, Amen. thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate the kind words. Hard work is, is something that's built into us uh, as we were uh, growing up. So uh, it's something that if uh, I, I often find myself, if there's uh, I'm not doing something or just uh, at home, I, I can't turn off my brain. <laughs> so I'm constantly working <laughs> in my head, at least. So Nabadi Foods, so this is a company uh, I founded with my partner, my wife, and uh, my dad uh, came in to invest in us. We, we started this company back in 2014 out of real passion for food. We, we love food and uh, we used to live in Montreal. So we, we went out and enjoyed food out there and it was easy to find plant-based foods and uh, at restaurants and so on. But when we moved to Alberta in 2012, uh, we found that the offerings the offering were, were, were lacking and uh, we, we ended up making a lot more at home. And we thought to ourselves, like, hey, how about, you know, we always wanted to start a business. We, we, we love food. This is our passion. Why not do something? Let's test it out and, and see where it goes. When, uh, and take it to the farmer's markets. And, and we found um, that it was easier to get started with desserts. It was very difficult to find gluten-free desserts uh, that, that are completely plant-based, made with whole fruits and nuts. So we did that, and it was very successful. We we landed Remedy Cafe in in, uh, in Edmonton pretty quickly within a month or two, uh, being in the farmers market. A, a month later, we found ourselves getting our own uh, small space that we're currently in. Uh, six years later, and, and producing our products from here, and and working more on development. Yeah. Uh, of the next uh, product line. So uh, we're an Edmonton uh, plant-based company. We are really focused on developing high quality plant-based products to inspire those that value their health uh, to indulge in real clean plant-based foods for a nourished, sustainable, and compassionate life. And those three are very, very important. You cannot enjoy life and having a great lifestyle if you're not nourished. And, and that lifestyle is sustainable and it must be compassionate. And Nabati, why we chose that? Nabati it means plant-based in Arabic. So it really describes who we are, what we do as a company and as people. We would use something uh, that really describes who we are rather than coming up with some other name. So what we do as, as a company and we're, what we're offering, our value proposition here is that we offer our plant, whole natural plant-based products for health conscious and, uh, consumers looking to indulge in health, healthier foods as they transition away from legacy foods without sacrificing taste. And we did this by making our products uh, as well, uh, egg-free, dairy-free, gluten-free, soy-free. Uh, they're certified uh, gluten-free, uh, vegan, and kosher. So we looked at all these market segments and we said, let's make something that, that is easily uh, uh, acceptable by everybody. And it has to be really good so anybody can have them while you know, at a dinner table. If everybody uh, is at a dinner table, you don't you don't want to be the host uh, and have to worry about somebody not being able to consume uh, food that's on the table. So it, making something that everybody can enjoy was very, very important early on. So our products, 
We have our plant-based dairy-free cheesecakes, <laughs> and you can see the tiramisu here, our top seller. It's uh, it's an amazing dessert. I love the regular legacy tiramisu, so we had to make one. And we made our plant-based cheese. The idea here is that we uh, we wanted to bridge the gap between dairy cheese and plant-based cheeses. Uh, and, and we did that. I believe we did that when it comes to cheese. We made something that is incredible. It melts like their cheese. It behaves like it. And it doesn't look like metal plastic. <laughs> uh, and this month, we launched our plant-based meats, something that uh, we, we are really excited about. Uh, and we're focusing on plant-based chicken uh, alternatives. Uh, unlike everybody else going for red meat, uh, we, we have our own uh, skews there. But uh, plant-based chicken, we, we were really dissatisfied with what the offerings out there. They're not really uh, great testing in terms of comparing it to actual chicken or fish uh, when it comes to the fish skews. Uh, we, we, we believe that we did that and we did it unbreaded. So we give the consumer freedom. And it's really about the, giving the consumer freedom to um, create their own recipes uh, at, at home or cook the product however they like. So, uh, and, and, and making it gluten-free as well. So they have the choice to do whatever they want. Uh, so our distribution channels here in Canada, we are partnered with Tree of Life, our exclusive distributor. Uh, they are a Kihi company, division of Kihi. And uh, we work with GFS and Cisco to distribute our products across Canada as well for food service. Uh, we're in Soda Save On Foods with our dairy-free cheesecakes uh, in Whole Foods Market, Georgia, Maine, Foodland in Ontario, Vegan Supply, uh, Vegan Essentials in the States, uh, Metro, and, and, and so many other stores. Uh, we're, we're about 400 stores in Canada and 120 in, in the U.S. right now and growing strong. Recently, we finalized a, uh, a round. Uh, we were looking to actually raise capital to, uh, to grow. We, we, we've been re uh, injecting money into this business over the last six years as, as an as we were putting thing, uh, the, the building blocks re, uh, ourselves. And uh, we got to a point where we're like, okay, we need a serious amount of money to really grow. We got to the point where we have this, the products, we have the distribution, but we need the sales and the marketing and uh, to really take off. So we closed the round uh, with uh, e Beyond Global. Uh, that was two months ago. Uh, and now we're looking at the next round uh, so we're raising capital, uh, get a larger facility, about seven times our space. And we're working on uh, 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 a few things that uh, I can't really talk about right now. But in terms of capital and, 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 and finding the right investors, as Corey was talking uh, earlier, it's really important to set this, what I call set the specs. What do you need? Uh, but that has to be based on your vision. It's very important to go, okay, this is my business. Where do I want to be in two, four, six, eight, ten 10 years? Where do you want to be? What do you want to achieve? You need to have very specific achievable goals as well as a very vague vision. The achievable goals are what will get you to that vision. Uh, but you need to have these. And, and, and using these, you can define what kind of investor do you really want? Do you want them to be part of the business, have skin in the games, active or not? And, and that's what we did, is, is try to find an investor that really understands our business, understands our vision, what we're trying to do. Uh, we're, we're a plant-based company, not a dessert company or a dairy-free alter alternative company. So... If you're trying to, let, I'll use this example, if you're trying to create the next Unilever for plant-based foods, you need an investor that really understands this. And, and people that around you that understands this, uh, understand this to provide you the right support. And that's what we did. We found a Beyond Global and they have the right people. They, have the, they understand us and they can come in as partners to understand uh, and support us. Uh, understanding what we're trying to do and support us. So what we're working on right now is a rapid expansion. We have quite a bit of demand for our products. And we're at a point where we can't really pursue further business without having to uh, raise capital and, and, and support that. So, so we're at a point where like, okay, we to, to move forward and grow f exponentially, we need capital. And that's what we're looking for. We're, we're working on raising half a million dollars in the interim for the next two, three months uh, to use uh, and have the production capability for the next five, six years.
And this is something to take not one line, product line, but three. We have quite a bit of R&D going on. So uh, one thing to note, raising capital t- does take quite a bit of time. Uh, it took us at least six months, if I, if I uh, counted correctly. Um, we thought maybe three, four months, uh, maybe less, depending on the investors, um, if, the, if they're willing to move faster. But it actually takes quite a bit of time. Um, it, it involved uh, introductory calls, uh, meeting their, their people, getting vetted by diff- and, 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 and talking to different people, part of uh, eBeyond, uh, to really gauge what kind of person I am and what the team is here and what we're doing and what we're capable of. Uh, are, are we the right people for them and are they the right people for us? And I did have to fly to Vancouver to actually seal the deal. So it, it's, it's something that it's not simple, it's not straightforward, not something that you can just do over uh, a virtual call. You really have to prove yourself to, uh, to, to the investor. And the same thing is you, you have to figure out what type of investor this person or, or a, a group is. You have to gauge them as well and, and, and figure them out. Because do you want an investor that comes in and exits really quick? Or do you want somebody that is, is it's basically like a marriage. It's, that's the best way to look at it. You're, you're marrying somebody, but in terms of a business, you, you, you're there, you want somebody that will be there for you in the long term. Looking at your long-term financial needs, that is very, very difficult, but you kind of have to do that. So when, when looking at the, the goal of where we want to be in two years and look at what you need in terms of capital to get there. So we, we define that and we broke it up in, in, in smaller amounts so we can get the job done. Uh, raising money is, is something that you will constantly do. It doesn't stop. Your job changes very quickly from running the business to raising capital. And that's where when you raise capital, you need the right team behind you working to, to make sure things function. Because you're, as a founder, you're, you're going to be focused on raising capital. Uh, to uh, and 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 getting the right people to work with you, uh, and and that's where prof- the, having the right professionals uh, to support uh, to support you as you as you grow the business is very critical. You can't just take the money and just spend it on on, on things that are not important. You need to have a solid foundation that uh, and and that involves human resources and and the business itself being able to uh, grow in terms of sales. Thank you. Uh, one thing I wanted to share, it, when it comes to finding the right investor, you need somebody that can be there for you in the ups and downs. And, and that's very uh, important. It's not always about up. Uh, if, if they can't uh, t- uh, um, listen to you rambling, they're not the right people. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Ahmed. That was just fantastic. Some real life examples and real life experience. And again, It's just been a pleasure working with you and uh, you can tell from the presentation, I'm sure the audience can understand just how uh, deep uh, knowledge you have of your business and how committed you are to it. So thank you for that. So now is our question and answer portion of the webinar. If you can please type your questions into the chat, then we'll have Chris Glass read them out. Our first question is from Mike in, uh, he asks, uh, can you explain how to target and pitch to an international investor? Say you're seeking an initial investment of $5 million and an investment of $50 million later on. Well, I, I'm not sure there's a lot of difference between uh, an international investor or a, a Canadian investor, for example. I think it's more important that, uh, as Ahmed talked about, there's a fit between you and the investor and that they are interested in your industry. Um, and, and it really is like a marriage. That's a, you know, a, a, a really great analogy because you're going to be living with those people in your business for a long time. And if you don't have uh, a good partner, if your uh, vision isn't aligned, if they're not, you know, if you, if you get involved with someone that wants to sell the company in two years, when your goal is to grow it and make it a multinational in 10 years, there's going to be instant conflict. So I'm not sure I can speak too much to the international part other than to say, um, you you know, I I don't think it's a whole lot different. Uh, The one thing that could be beneficial 
is there are uh, investors that have invested perhaps in Europe or elsewhere that have expertise that they could bring to the table for you. And that could be very beneficial. Our next question isn't really a question. It was just a congratulations, Samit, and thank you for sharing your experiences. What specific channels did you use to source your investors? So I, I looked up different platforms. Um, I've uh, came in contact with uh, Corey through another presentation, uh, and that actually uh, got c- connected me with another uh, uh, person, Scott uh, Eckner, and he was actually uh, the one that ref- uh, connected me to Eat Beyond. So it's really a lot of networking. I think that's that's what really did it. Because I, I came, I, I was reached out to by international investors too, from Thailand, from Vietnam, from the Middle East, uh, the UK. Something that we, in talks I found out very early on that they're not the right uh, fit. And it's not really a great idea to go for international investors from the beginning. Uh, at least that's my experience because each region will, they have different type of approach to investing. So in the Middle East, for example, they focus on profitability. If they were giving you a hundred, let's say X amount of dollars, they want a return as, as fast as possible within within the year. They care about the return and, and earning dividends and so on, which which might not, which is not really uh, ideal for a, a, a startup or a growing, growing company, sorry, because you're focused on growth. And when you're focused on growth, you're sacrificing profitability in, in, in most cases. Uh, other investors, they were they were looking at uh, borrowing money to lend to uh, to invest in us. Which I was like, why would you do that if you're not going to put in your own money? I don't want to, you know, do this. So it, it, um, there's there's several platforms um, that you can share your deck and and all your financials on. But really, I think the best approach, uh, which really worked out uh, and was effective, is is networking and 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 being in contact with the right people like Corey and that have connections and know people that can understand your business and, and connect you to the right people. Because I've reached out to uh, venture capitals or family funds and, and so on. And, and they, ha- they all have different scopes. So you, you could be wasting time months and months trying to reach out to everybody. But I think if you, you're in contact with the right people that have contacts, that's the best way to go about it kind of leads into my next question. Is there typically an introduction to start the active investor seeking process? Yes. Uh, you, you need that first introduction. Excellent. And there was a question about grants. There are a lot of really good grants out there. You have to have a good understanding of what they will do because you can spend a lot of time chasing grants and not get anywhere. And I always say to my clients with grants, it's all about fit with mandate. It doesn't matter how wonderful your business is, how great your product is. If you go to a grant provider and you don't uh, understand what their mandate is and you can't position your project, and it's always project specific, if you can't position your project to fit with the mandate, you're not going to have a very good outcome. And so I, I just caution people, they're wonderful because they're usually free money. I also tell people to start looking for them before they exhaust all of their resources because they usually want 50% funding from you and 50% funding from them. So again, it's a matter of understanding how to work with them. They're great in some circumstances if the timing works, but I hate to see companies hang their hat on them and spend six months trying to get money only to be disappointed. It it seems like there's different sources of funding for different projects and finding that right fit is uh, the most important thing. Am I getting that right, Corey? That's, That's a fair comment for sure. Absolutely. Well, with that, it seems that we don't have any more questions in the chat box. So uh, Shannon is going to set up some breakout rooms. Uh, The reason why we do these breakout rooms is the best part of uh, in-person seminars and and that is to network and get to know each other. And in this new COVID world, we don't have that opportunity. So this is our virtual opportunity to be in a more intimate setting with our guest speakers and a little bit more free flowing conversation. So I encourage you to go to those rooms with an open mind, turn on your videos, turn on your microphones, and let's get to know each other a little bit better. So with that, Shannon, I'll turn it back over to you. Welcome back, everyone. Maybe we can just hear the, the highlights from each room. Well, Ahmed, do you want to take what you talked about in our room? You were the star as usual. 
don't, don't, don't hesitate to reach out to suppliers across the sea. It's actually a lot easier than anybody uh, really thinks to, uh, to deal with uh, um, getting equipment uh, from across the ocean. But um, I think one thing, if you're paying for something, you're paying for what you're getting. So I think my background kind of helps me out because a lot of the equipment comes in and it needs some work. And then I, I get it working. <laughs> Don't hesitate to look for options that won't cost you a lot. Hey, how about Donna's room? Oh, we learned a lot about uh, some challenges with financing and different things. So I don't know if Corey wants to talk about that a little bit. Morley asked a question about how COVID was impacting companies' ability to raise money. I, you know, Basically, it's it's impacted all kinds of business. I think it's going to have an ongoing impact, even if we're fortunate enough to get rid of COVID. And uh, it just makes it more difficult because it's uh, so important to meet people in person and get a feel for them, uh, both for the companies seeking capital and for those that are uh, looking to invest. And it really does, you know, Ahmed talked about that, about how important it is for both sides to get to know each other is just far more difficult when you're doing it online. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite Dan to do the closing notes. Thanks uh, everybody for joining today. And I really want to thank our speakers, both Corey and Ahmed. Uh, we've of course been following the body foods for some time and he's a very good, strong supporter of PPAA. I do want to, uh, I think this was great. Um, again, in our series of the protein 101 this will be the last one of that series. And next one we will be having in uh, January, a session on mental health and agriculture, and that will feature do more ag. And so welcome to it, sign up for that one as well. So I also would like if everybody could go onto the session and maybe fill out the post event survey, just let us know what you're thinking. We're always comfortable or like to hear how we can improve, et cetera. So whether it's good news or bad news, please fill that out and get back to us. You know, I, I really want to take a moment to, we heard about the success that Nabati has had in working with Corey and, and he mentioned another name and that's Scott Exner. And both, we are fortunate at PPA have both of both Corey and Scott as members of our board. And I guess it speaks to the experience and uh, some of the expertise that we have around the table within PPAA. Uh, Scott, of course, is a, practices law with MLT Aikens. He's a partner in Calgary and uh, does a lot of these deals together. And so great, great work there. And glad, glad to hear that that success uh, story and, and the connection through those two folks. So PPAA, of course, has for uh, since the conception of the organization has really recognized and heard over and over again how important access to capital truly is. And so this is one of the reasons for this session. We're working on some projects as well to try to improve that situation and uh, working with uh, some funding applications to, to help in that area. Again, thanks for everybody for now for joining and look forward to connecting with you either in the next virtual event or uh, some other way in the, in, the, in the time being. So I'm gonna sign off, turn it back to Shannon and thanks. Uh, for co coordinating and arranging this, Janet. Perfect. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you so much, Corey and Ahmed. It was awesome to hear your stories. And we look forward to seeing everyone at the next webinar in January for mental health. Mm -hmm.